and she said, if you do something else, I want to help you with it. So she helped me with it. She's an you know, author slash uh, whatever they are. So you have to give it to keep it. You have to give it away to keep it. So I guess I'm talking about a trip here to down memory lane, pretty much, you know. Yeah. Stopped at my Boy Scout camp when I was a kid. Went up past my brothers. You know, changed my mind. Blah blah blah. I was talking about the dream I had, and uh, you know that was the beginning of my spiritual journey. I didn't quite know what the hell that was, but my my dream was about that. I went to a place called Chit Chat. The place was, you know, the best 850 bucks I ever spent. Chit Chat is uh, it's a rehab for all kinds of stuff, you know, ACOA, alcohol, drugs, you know, uh, you know, all incest, just all kinds of stuff. And uh, I was I was sober about five years, and I wasn't going anywhere. And I went I went to uh, I started going to Alamo, upstate. I was living upstate, and uh, if you're a Trump, you should be going to Alamo. Because all your friends are drunks and drug addicts. So uh, I was going to Alamon and I was there for about a year and a couple of women, women pulled me aside one night and they said, we cannot believe the changes in you in the last year. And I couldn't see it yet. And then, you know, maybe that second year I went to uh, Chit Chat for the ACOA we had. And that was, uh, it was 850 bucks for a week. It was 23 years ago. And it's the best 850 bucks I've spent in my life. They work on themselves. Yeah. You're, you're working on yourself for AA such drinking. Right. And you have fellowship, but you don't really get involved in changing you in the element. Yeah, well, or learning how to deal with alcoholics, which is what you are, and also other ones that are in your life. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, you know, a really, you know, I went, I went, I went to Al-Anon for a long time, like five years, six years, something like that. And I and the ACO, you know, the, the Chit Chat program was just spectacular. And they recommended that you go for therapy for at least six months after you stop, because all these issues are going to come up. You know, and it's issues about whatever issues you got. So I, I went back there. They, they always sent you a newsletter, you know, every three or four months. Yeah. So maybe 15 years went by, 20 years, and there was a, a therapy thing with horses, and I, and I like cricket, so I said, well, speaking of which was one of my issues, and uh, so speaking of that, so I like cricket, so I went to this, this, the guy was bringing two horses, and it was like horse therapy, it was all women, it was like 15 women and me, and a guy that brought the horses, and uh, women are a whole different if, they, if there's a way to talk about it, they're going to fucking talk until it's dead. And uh, I got to see that, this thing. They, uh, you know, it was raining out and ugly, and so we're going to start a fire. So the women all want to start a fire. So they have a pack of matches, and they start lighting matches and try to start the fire. So they'd light the match, and the fire wouldn't get going, and they'd talk about it. And they'd talk and talk and talk, and then they'd try it again. And then that match with the fire would go out. And then they'd talk and talk about it again. And this went on until they were down to the last match. And I looked at them and I said, I want you to know something, that I am not going to go for another pack of matches when this pack runs out. I'm not going to be the gentleman to do that. Because this, this is about learning about things here. So 
this, there's a lot of stuff. This, this book spans a lot of years. You know, it's about uh, a lot of stuff.
banjo check. Yeah. 
Chicago and reloaded, and then we went to San Francisco or LA and empty. Then we went to San Diego where he lived. We stayed there for a couple of weeks, and then we loaded in San Diego and LA. Oh, so what was his job? He was a furniture mover. He was a furniture mover. Yeah, yeah. He was one of the top ten line haulers for Beacon's Van Lines. Oh. So this he was a West Virginia hillbilly. And this guy had more sayings, like, you know, faster than the freshly fucked fox in the forest fire, <laughs> slicker than snot on the doorknob. You know, just an idiot. One day he says to a waitress in, in Virginia, he goes, Are you a rancher? And she goes, Why no? Why did you ask? You know, I go straight face. He goes, You had such great calves, I thought you were a rancher. <laughs> and I watched him get away with it. You know, and I'm a, a, you know, a New York boy, and I think I'm pretty slick. He had me beat so.
made sure I didn't get too much trouble, which I thought was pretty good. Okay. Uh, how old uh, were you when this was going on? I was 19 when I learned how to drive a truck, mm -hmm. and then I moved out to Montauk when I was about 21, and I drove a construction truck for a few guys, and then I learned, you know, that I would putz around in the back hole, learn how to dig, and, you know, to be a crane operator, I learned that. But, um, so what are you doing now for a living? Oh, I do tree work. Tree work? Yeah. Cutting down trees? And yeah. I, uh, I went through a divorce, and I got rid of the crane service, and I ended up upstate New York, and one of the neighbors asked me if I could trim his trees. And How many trees do it? It was five acres of it. Five, 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 five acres of pine trees, yeah. It's a forest. <laughs> you know, and it, you know, they're 150 foot tall. It's pine and they're this big around. And soft wood, right? Yeah. Soft, soft, yeah. So I said, let me find out what the stuff costs. It was about 500 bucks for the belt, the gas, and a couple of chainsaws, a couple of rope. So I started, you know, I said, oh, oh, what do I care? I'll climb. And I started climbing. And Tree work is like exponential. If any three guys should be in bed together, it's the logger, the sawyer, and the, and the carpenter. But none of them know what the other guys do. You know, oh, I want to have a partner. I got to do this in part. Well, you can do it in anything you want. But people get stuck in, you know, it, it's amazing that the communication is so, they don't know what the other one's doing. So you want to be a I was taking trees down. I was saving, you know, like if I got a nice log, like a bottom of a pine tree that's clear pine, you know, I would save it, or, or a walnut, or, and I would save this stuff. And I fell in love with wood in junior high school. When, I, when we did a walnut, they brought walnut and pine out of the basement, and I went, oh, holy Jesus, to me it was like, you know, coconut chocolate, it was the, you know, just amazing. So, the more you do tree work, the more, the, you know, I learned to climb, I learned to, you know, I was, uh, I was making 250 bucks a day, and this is 30 years ago, and it was cash money. And, you know, I'd climb up the tree and jump out on a rope and never pay me. Did you wear the boots with the Yeah, with the gas. Like, like growing up the telephone pole. Yeah, only the bigger okay, gas. The belt? Yeah. You did that? Yeah, with the ropes. The ropes. Yeah. Yeah. Like this. And, uh, you know, then you start sawing the wood up and making a little few things, and then you start realizing that there's all these different types of material, and the old and different things, and then I came to back to East Hampton, and I started getting you know, looking at windmills and timber framing. And, you know, the, the, the windmills, that technology, along with that, for, that grandfather's clock was probably made by the Dominic brothers in here, here in East Mahogany, Canada. right? Huh? Mahogany? Uh, no, I haven't okay. looked at it, but it probably is Mahogany. Yeah, yeah. But it was probably made by the Dominic brothers, who also built, built windmills. And they used different woods for different things, like they would use apple wood for the gears, for the teeth on the gears. They would use white oak for brake pants. They, you know, they knew all these things about wood. You know, like white oak is really rock resistant. Uh, elm is extremely strong. Chestnut is, is, is as strong as elm, but rock, 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 very rock resistant. Uh, they used to use that in horse stalls because horses could kick it and kick it and not break it. And you just keep sure. learning. So tree work was just exponential knowledge. You just kept learning stuff. Then I got a sawmill, I had a couple, three sawmills. Where was your sawmill located? I had it back on the Springs Fire Road. Really? Right. They, took a, they took a big elm tree down, the Baker Elm in the village here. And it was five feet in diameter, five or six feet in diameter. And I took all the pieces that I wanted from it when they were taking it down. And I took that big log and they set it on my, my track, my trailer. I took it back to the house, rolled it off, and they set the Alaskan mill on top of it. And we slabbed it in four inch thick slabs. So the piece of wood was four inches thick, five feet wide, and 12 feet long. And I made tables out of that. And a piece of, uh, I also made a little, a small table in that for the Baker house. What was, it, what was that uh, freak thing that came through the springs? Oh, that was like a car and because tornado slash. 
place that year, I could see why he tried to make a living there. You know, and he ended up eventually owning the property, but and my mother got it. But uh, they grow melons in, in, in there. You know, you go out to the old west, and we got there. And back in the
it's like turning uh, a TV to a station that's not playing. <laughs> so, so you cross over. And they use only a few things. But my whole journey through sobriety has been trying to figure these things out and to get happy. You know, I didn't get happy so I could be miserable. I mean, I didn't stop drinking so I could be miserable. So, but, but drinking, drinking uh, cluttered the air. You've been sober now. That's just the same thing. years old. 31 years. 31 years. Well, the whole thing again, yeah. the, for me, the whole process of it has 
my senior year, and uh, it's about January, and my counselor calls me in, my, my guidance. She goes, you don't, you don't have a series. You can't graduate this spring unless you take I'm like, and I'm the one that's, you know, not going to college. How did you go to, you know, how did you go to college and not be able to do your job? It, it always is done. Well, I went through a strange experience. I went to college, and then pressure from my mommy and daddy, I worked in corporate, and I was going out of my mind. Yeah. And one day I just told them to stick up in the sun, don't shine, and I picked up my toolbox and came out here and became a building contractor. There you go. And without any training, I did a great job. All the damn training I did in college to be in corporate gave me nothing. so long before I used my innate aptitude instead yeah. of trying to be somebody I wasn't. Yeah. You, you appear to be that kind of person. You are just who put your innate aptitudes. I followed the path that I wanted. Yeah. And I was lucky that I did that. I was, I, I, when I was working for Oscar, we stopped and, and we picked up a, a, a thing for a baby, bassinet, whatever. It's, it's, you know, it's got ro rockers underneath and blah, blah, blah. It was made out of walnut. The guy had grown the trees, taken the trees down, took them to the sawmill, sliced them up, and made this beautiful bassinet. You could feel the love coming out of it. You know what I mean? My grandfather taught me how to use a lathe when I was a little kid. You know, and, and I was just thinking about my my grandfather spent his whole life under this woman's thumb. Under her thumb. You know, she was the daughter of the American Revolution, blah, blah, blah. Her shit didn't stink. You know, oh my God. Ugh. And my grandfather was up in the shop making shit and wants to sell it, give it away. She's like, we can't do that. So that's what we can't do that. You know, and then I thought about my mother, who after a few years of marriage to my father, realized that it was not going to work. And she needed somehow to get out of that. And she went back to college and became a librarian. She got a master's in library. And, uh, she got out from under his thumb. Yeah. And when my son was about five years old, I went to my father's house for dinner. And uh, we're, he's with his third wife now, and she's fucking crazy. <laughs> she's got three kids, two are gay, one's a drunk, and she oh. thinks the drunk's fucked up, oh, you know? So <laughs> we're there for dinner, and my son plays a stupid game called Bees and Butterflies, and it's these date plastic pieces that end up with like a bushel of bees and butterflies on. So she's making the centerpiece for the table, and my son's a little, he's gay, my son, he's eventually turned out to be gay, which is fine with me, I, I, it's okay, I love him, I love him, I'm not, it doesn't, you know, does not enter into my thinking. So I love my son, whatever he decides to do, whatever makes his life happy, is really important, because that's what I learned through this whole process that we're talking about. Yeah, that's right. So, he's arguing with this woman who won't let him put his piece on the table. So I catch this, and he's crying, he's upset, you know? And I said, hey, Alex, come here, I want to talk to you. And I took him in the bathroom, and I said, look, not for nothing, but we're going to finish dinner like gentlemen, but I promise you, we're not coming back unless things change, okay? He says, okay, Daddy. You know, it's all in this bit. So I, I called my old man up about three days later, and he says, I said, Dad, what part we did to Alex was unacceptable. He didn't even catch his breath. He said, well, I'll take him his house. And I hung up the phone and I thought about that and I said, he told me to fuck myself. <laughs> nah, he couldn't have done that.
I've opened up again. Yeah, right. I did not have to. I talked to my girlfriend. I get back, you know, we get back together and we're talking about it. And I told this story to her and the, the therapist. And he goes, what is this about, Phil? And I said, I was never good enough. Mm. I was never good enough for my father. Yeah. And because I was never good enough, I was always fighting to be better yeah. or to do good. I don't have to do that anymore. No. What a gift. All this, this stuff is just, it, it's so spectacular. You know, I took these tests from the doctor in the city called the Johnson Connor Research Foundation. They test innate as opposed to acquired aptitudes. Yeah. We had a little three days in a row, eight hours a day, taking multiple choice. And they've been testing since 1910, so they have some reason for saying what they do. Yeah. And when they gave me all my forms, I was first just out of army. I was too stupid to read it and understand. I just filed it away. And then seven years after I said bye bye to corporate, it was on my own. I was walking by their office once in the city. I said, Chief, I'm going to go in and talk to them. So they pulled my records and they asked me what was I was doing since corporate. And I told them, and they were lost for it. They said, You did all that on your own? I said, I know, but my mommy and daddy don't talk to me anymore. No they said, You did the right thing. Yeah. And I, I'm sometimes astounded by how naive parents can be. And you said that they're thinking about themselves. I know I embarrassed the hell out of my mother when I left corporate because she thought that was the most important thing to do. Yeah. And so was my dad. But how can that be so, so blind? Thanks. 
this, but he's, I need something much further along in the spiritual realm. Wow. You know? yeah. So, after this guy died, I'm talking to him, and I said to him, you know, Steve, you know, he's, he, we did a critical analysis afterwards, and, you know, he says, things are going to come up, things are going to happen, you're going to wonder. So I was talking to him, he said to me, you know, when one time St. Francis of Assisi was in his garden, I went away, cleaned the weeds, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And his friend comes in and says to him, hey, St. Francis, if, if you were going to die tomorrow, what would you be doing different? And he thought about that for a minute. He says, I'd probably be hoeing in my garden. Be what? Hoeing in this oh, garden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not hoeing, chasing hoes down the street. But. <laughs> so, I thought about that and I realized that that's what I do. There's a couple of things I might want to do better. Like if I had more money, I'd take more trips on my motorcycle. But basically, that's what I do. I'm here having fun. I do what I want to do. And uh, I need to continue on that path. This, this is what I love about you. You know, the, the Zorba. The Zorba the Greek. In that great movie, it was Anthony Quinn. This old man is planting peach trees. He's an old man. Why are you planting these? Yeah. 